What's up? It is Raphael Barlow with the Run the Floor podcast. And today I have a special, special guest. This is, uh, for me, it's like the, uh, <laughs> this is the guy that got me into the whole podcast game. It was something that I wanted to do for a while. And, you know, I think I'm like most people. You have something that you want to do. And you say, oh, I'll do it tomorrow or I'll do it. And you look up and time goes by and you never actually do it. And if it wasn't for my guest here inviting me on his podcast, and he actually reached out to me on, on my NBA Draft Junkies Facebook page. And I, I don't know how I missed it. I just missed it. And I think I may that have That was responded. like three years ago. <laughs> yeah, I responded years later. And saying I apologized, and he still had me on as a guest, and we've built like this. I mean, I, I consider it a friendship, and he's got me. He motivated me to start my own podcast, and now I'm starting my second podcast. And so he will always be someone that I will be thankful for, just because I really enjoy this, and he's he's helped you know kind of push me out and to uh, out of my comfort zone in a sense. So I wanted to introduce my guest, Gerald Glassford from the Lakers Fast Break. And I mean, he has a bunch of other sites that he, <laughs> <laughs> that he, he does podcasts for. So thank you for coming on. I really appreciate you taking this time. Well, well I'm truly honored, my friend. Uh, very kind words. Um, I just, like I said, it's, it's been a pleasure, a unique honor to start these podcasts that we've done on the Lakers Fast Break and also Pop Culture Cosmos. I put some of our time on there as well, and, and I've truly relished them, uh, and I truly appreciate it. And I consider you a friend as well. Uh, and I was wondering, can I borrow some money? I need to you know, go grab some money. No, I'm kidding. Just kidding you. But um, it, it's just been an honor, my friend. And uh, I, you know, anybody who I see just, just has the itch. I can see the itch there. I want to try and help them any way possible to get into the podcasting field. And I, you and I both know, we, we've seen there's, there's over 2 million podcasts out there. I think that was last time I, I checked into it. But again, it's, your way of expressing yourself to to a larger audience and you have such a great platform with all the things that you do and you work so hard and you you're just so astute when it comes to everything basketball and i've just truly appreciated and i love your stories that's the thing i love about you most man it's just you have those stories you you are the guy that just will hold and grab the attention of, of a group of people whether they're listening or whether they're around listening to you close up and just, just be so mesmerized by all the things that you got to say, whether it's your, your life story, whether it's all your travels, whether it's just your way of looking at things. And I just truly appreciate every time I get a chance to talk to you, my friend. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I guess now we have to get into what the people tuned in for. Okay. Well, th thanks for shopping. The step. <laughs> thanks for stopping by. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if they tuned in to hear us compliment each other for no. a whole hour, but no, like I, I appreciate the kind words. And, and like I say, you, you know how I, I feel about how, you, how much you've helped me out, but now let's get into the NBA playoff first day playoff. I mean, it's a little late. I've never watched playoff basketball in August. Usually the only basketball we get in August is Drew League or, you know, maybe every four years we'll get some Olympic basketball. <laughs> but yes. who would have thought on August 17th, it's like the opening day of the NBA playoffs. So this, this is usually like the dead time in yeah. the NBA. This is when all the NBA execs go on their vacations with their families and, and the players, you usually see those pictures of them on, you know, on the, off the Italian coast or something like that, you know, and those yachts and whatnot. This is not the time you usually see them playing on the hardwood. So this is very weird to say the yeah. least. Yeah. And I mean, you know, my main thing is the NBA draft and it's August and we're still waiting on the NBA lottery you know, it's it's just a weird time all across the world. But I'm thankful for Adam Silver and the NBA and everything they did to put this bubble together because it's been a success. I mean, it's been it's been better than what I expected. And I had pretty high expectations because I knew that guys wanted to play, but I mean, these guys are in 
good shape. I mean, there's a few yeah. guys that, that weren't in good shape, but it just shows that, you know, during this time that these guys really love the game. I feel like there's a lot of negative perceptions about NBA players. It's been, you know, these rich guys that like to party and, and do this and that. And it just shows that they were working during this yeah. pandemic, even if they weren't playing on the court and you can't really simulate basketball shape, but guys were working, whether they was running mountains or on the Peloton or whatever, but they kept themselves in good shape, which means they had hope that there was still going to be, you know, a season that it would finish. And then here we are. I mean, the eight games or, you know, for some teams, nine, that the seeding games were great. I mean, like we had, Dame Lillard having 40, 50, and 60-point games. He had Luka Doncic had a crazy game against Milwaukee. He had a 30-point game, a 20-rebound game, a 19-assist a game. I just thought the basketball was great. T.J. Warren, you know, kind of made a, a name for himself. And, I mean, we had like a little, you know, the bubble beast <laughs> with the uh, – with the Clippers and Lillard. Like it was, I think the NBA has to just be super excited and high-fiving themselves that this plan that they put together worked out. I think the, the seed-in uh, or the play-in game was a, a great idea. I mean, the Suns, I didn't even mention them. They're a great story. And all of that, and now here we are. First day, and let's talk about the series that everyone is talking about. Lakers Blazers. Now, you are you run the Lakers Fast Break website, of course, and you're a contributor on Lakerholics. What is your thoughts on this series? Well, I mean, you couldn't ask for a tougher series as Laker Tom is is just enjoying it because he wants the the toughest series possible for the Lakers. And of the three that were like in the mix for it, as far as Memphis. Phoenix, like you said, who went 8-0. A uh, shout out to Campaign, a former Texas legend. Texas uh, legend. Who, yeah, who's, who's played himself into a, a nice contract there. So congratulations to him and the entire and he, team. So. He was in China early this year. Or, yeah, when I was in China, he played a few games there. And then uh, when I got back in February, I went to a Legends game and saw him play at a Legends game. So... It's like we've kind of had a similar path, except, you know, his, he made a little bit more money than I made. <laughs> well, your, your destiny lies with the NBA, my friend, and I, I'm wishing for it, hoping for you every day for that. Uh, but getting back to your series, Mr. Blazer 500, uh, I want to go ahead and, and say right now, I know you're, you're a big Portland Trailblazers fan, and, and, and the work, we, like you said, was very strange for you at first when Laker Tom asked you to go ahead and start doing some videos for Lakerholics.com. But I will say this, this, it is going to be the test. But the thing is, how much work does the, the backcourt of C.J. McCollum and also as well Damian Lillard, how much do they have to do? Because right now they're, they're, yeah, <laughs> of course, a lot. Yeah. Nurkic, he, he's still not in the best shape as yet. You see, he's getting tired. Uh, he's, he is performing admirably. And again, as I said on our show, uh, you know, the Lakers fast break, I do want to pay respects to his grandmother uh, and his family for, for their loss on that. So uh, I do wish to go ahead and pay respects because he is playing with a very heavy heart, but He's also playing still, like I said, he's still trying to round into shape. And you've seen at the end of games where he is absolutely exhausted. Face red. Exactly. And <laughs> yeah. And, and right now they haven't gotten much rest. And, and it's fortunate for them that they didn't play a second, uh, you know, game in over the weekend. So that's at least to their benefits. At least they got a couple of days off. But even if that's the case, they are playing with a short rotation uh, outside of Gary Trent Jr., they don't have much coming off the bench. Uh, it's going to be tough for them. And plus, their defense is awful. I mean, right. they're, they're outscoring everybody at this point. And that seems to be a theme in the bubble. And that's something that you did mention is that, yeah, a lot of people have their conditioning back. But the one thing I see that a lot of teams don't have is a defensive cohesion working together on the defensive end. It seems to be more of a mindset of I will score now more than you will. That, you know, obviously we see the Mavericks. We even see to a extent 
the Clippers and some other teams that are normally more defensive focused, they're just right now not as a defensively put together yet. I mean, and for some of those teams, it'll come over the course of the playoffs, but the Lakers, despite their offensive ineptness over the course of the bubble, they've been able to at least be somewhat competent defensively. And I think that ultimately will be the issue, the thing for them that's going to come out on top. I had been reluctant to say to anybody on Lakerholics.com what the prediction was, because I wanted to save it for you, my friend. So I will say the Lakers in six. I will say the Lakers in six. So uh, it just comes down to also as well, how much can the bigger Laker guards affect the shots of the backcourt of C.J. McCollum and Damian Lillard. I know they're used to bigger guards, but at least if they can go ahead and slow them down a little to where they're in the 20-point range as opposed to the 30- and 40-point range, that will definitely help a lot for the Lakers overall. Yeah, I, um, I my prediction is <laughs> Blazers and six. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, um and here's why I think that they may have an advantage. If I'm not mistaken, they're like seven and two in their last nine games. Mm-hmm. And the two losses were to Boston, which they were down a bunch and they came back in that game and made it a game late. And then the game, I, th- I thought they should have won against the Clippers. Dame missed those two free throws. And they're already in playoff mode. Their playoffs started as soon as they got to Orlando. They didn't have the luxury of resting guys or just kind of feeling their way out. They've had to, like, win just to get to this point. So I think that their chemistry and their rhythm is fine. And even if I wasn't, like, a Blazers fan and I were a Lakers fan, I would have some concerns and questions about the Lakers' cohesiveness right now um there were games where it felt like anthony davis looked like he was a top five player in the world and then there were games where i'm like is he really just pacing himself because he just looked like he just was totally fine with settling for jumpers instead of attacking the basket i do think that there's a switch that he could turn on Same with LeBron. I don't think that he was really giving it his all. I think that, you know, he was saving himself, which is the luxury that they have, you know, by having such a great regular season that the Blazers didn't have. But I wonder, I don't wonder about those two so much. I mean, I I do have concerns if I were a Lakers fan about Anthony Davis reading double teams, because I feel like after that Toronto game, it seems like teams have, started kind of doubling him and there's been some some issues there i think that um the supporting cast for the lakers is going to be the difference maker if agree if teams can double ad and make everyone else knock down open shots i think it the lakers could have some issues and that's why i feel like with with uh, portland i think that they're one of the few teams especially if Collins plays, that has the size up front to match the Lakers if they go big. And most teams don't because Lakers could throw in JaVale, Dwight, and (laughs) you're always going to have an athletic big rebounding advantage. I think Portland, I don't think their bigs are are necessarily better, but I do think that they can have, they can match big for big if it gets to that point, which I don't think it will. I think both teams are going to end up playing a little smaller um, I think that if the Lakers try to trap Dame, having Nurkic helps because he can make plays for others. If you give him the ball in the middle of the floor, he can, you know, find Trent or Carmelo on the wings for three. If not, then he can put the ball on the floor. I think he has a a weight or size advantage on Davis in a sense because once he, he gets you on that hip, it's just kind of hard for you know, for him to be defended. Now he is going to have some issues with Davis as far as like running the floor and probably chasing him off screens. Not, not necessarily off screens, but if the Lakers are going to run plays for AD to pop out and shoot jumpers, I don't think Nurk is going to chase him out there. 
And as a Blazers fan, I kind of hope AD makes a couple of them and he starts to fall in love. And I would much rather have him shooting <laughs> jumpers and then running plays for him to shoot open Jays than him attacking the paint or, or being in the glass. Um, but yeah, I just, I'm just the Lakers supporting cast outside of Kuzma. And I mean, I guess Deion Waiters has played good. They just have not looked good. I mean, Danny Green, I was joking with my brothers. Like, I didn't even know he was in the bubble. He, We're still waiting for him. <laughs> yeah. And he was their, I mean, outside of Davis, he was their big free agent guy that they expected him to play better. I, I mean, he he does have these games. I, I want to say, like, I think there was a game, was it last year, where he didn't make a shot for a while, but then all of a sudden he caught fire. He does show up in playoffs. Like, I mean, he had that series against LeBron and the Spurs. I feel like he just did not miss anything. If they get that contribution out of him, then it's going to be tough, nearly impossible to beat the Lakers. But if he's not shooting the ball well, it it, it really, like, kind of somewhat evens the playing field a little bit when the Lakers versus any other team. So I think he's really the X factor. I mean, you know, Brian is going to give you his – you know, his 27, 28, 8, 10, something of that. Uh, you know, Davis is um, – he's going to get his numbers regardless just because he's going to play a lot of minutes and he's going to get up to shot attempts. But if Danny Green is, like I said, making shots, it's, it's going to be tough to beat them. So I'm banking on Danny Green still being cold. I'm banking on um, uh, the Blazers, their, their rhythm to be able to carry them through just because, like I said, they're already in playoff mode. They don't really have to turn on a switch. And, yeah, I'm just – I'm going to uh, stick with my prediction. Blazers and six. No, you're not unlike a lot of people out there. I mean, there's a lot of people questioning the Lakers. I just, it just, to me, again, what I've seen is that the Blazers, uh, even though they are in playoff mode, their defense – defensively yeah. it's just hard for them to stop anybody and if they give the lakers any kind of confidence that could be real trouble for the blazers i mean if the lakers like you said have been struggling mightily from the outside uh, danny green were, you know i almost felt like putting him on a you know on a milk carton you know as far as his picture have you seen this person and yeah. and because he's been sick and kcp the same thing for contavious caldwell pulp and and if they do go ahead, if you get any kind of effectiveness from either one of them consistently over the course of a five to seven game series, you're going to go ahead and be in a lot of trouble because AD is most predominantly going to be at the five now from the playoffs going forward. You're going to see less of Dwight Howard. You're going to see less of JaVale McGee. You're going to pre essentially see uh, a seven and a half, eight man rotation now from the Lakers, which is going to be better because you will predominantly see AD at the five, which I think he is best suited for. And you're right. He is going to have uh, some strength issues going against a slim down Nurkic, but uh, it, it works like, like you said, going forward, if he does not, if he takes smart shots, if he takes like 15 footers, which you and I know he can make a, quite a bit, you're right. But if he starts chucking up threes all the time, like he falls in love with it, like you said, and becomes a passive Anthony Davis, that could be an issue for the Lakers as well. And we've seen that over the course of the bubble when he falls in love with these outside shots and it just becomes very problematic because if he becomes less impactful on both ends of the floor. Yeah. I mean, the Pacers game is the first game that comes to mind where it just seems like he was playing like a stretch four, like, you're Anthony Davis. You're not Ryan Anderson. <laughs> you're, yeah. not, you're not Channing Fry. Attack the paint. But on the flip side of that, I want Melo to stay out of the paint. I don't want him in the paint at all, unless he has some crazy switch where he has, you know, uh, you know, one of the guards on him or something like that. Then I would be fine. But I just don't think Melo trying to post up LeBron or Anthony Davis does anything for the Blazers offense. He's been shooting good from three. Um, there are times where he seems like he's still trying to play mellow isolation ball. This is the worst team to try to play mid-range 
ISO contested jumpers because you're either going to shoot them against LeBron or AD or Howard or, or somebody like that. So hopefully he can knock down open J's. And then, like I said, if he gets a switch on one of the guards, maybe to the post, but I mean, his his game is suited now to be more so of a floor spacer than than isolation score. That's All right, so true. so who do you think is will be their eight man rotation? Well, like I said, it uh, at times you will see in the second half somebody like a, a Dwight Howard or Rajon Rondo when he gets back. Even though I don't really want him in the lineup, he's going to be in the lineup. You and I both have discussed that at right. length. Um, I think the the lineup will be what uh, you you my preferred lineup will be uh, KCP, Danny Green, uh, or Alex Caruso. Throw any one of those three, whoever's playing the best. Uh, then you've got Kyle Kuzma, LeBron James, and Anthony Davis. That should be the lineup that you're going to play the the predominant amount of minutes on. Of course, you're going to start JaVale McGee for his, what, uh, 10, 15 minutes a game or even less now in the playoffs. Uh, I guess, you know, they, they like to start with him because I guess they feel like they get an offensive rhythm. Although in the bubble, they've actually been getting off to horrible starts each and every game. But need I digress? Uh, then you're also going to see Dwight Howard. How much you're going to see of Dwight Howard depends on this type of team that they're playing. Against a Portland with big guys like Zach Collins and, and Nurkic, you've got – You've got Howard to come out there essentially to give you five fouls. That's that's what he is at this point. Now, two of them he gives up on each and every game up on, you know, just bad picks, illegal screens, because you, you and I both know that when he comes into the game, he's like good for two illegal screens a game. Mm-hmm. And he gets called for him. But at least he can give you other times where he's effective on the rebounding and the defensive end still. Uh, and, and Nurkic might allow him to go ahead and be more on the floor. But I could see him – and as they get along, especially go if they go against a Houston or another team that loves to go ahead and play smaller, then you will definitely not see Howard at for for long stretches of, of periods of time. So that's that's essentially it. And obviously, like I said, you'll see Alex Caruso, Kyle Kuzma, whether or not he's going to go ahead and stay a player that's coming off the bench. We'll wait and see if the Lakers struggle at all you're going to see Frank Vogel shift that lineup pretty quickly. You will see JaVale McGee sit, and you'll see Kyle Kuzma uh, in the starting lineup if the Lakers start to, let's say they fall a game behind Portland, let's say it goes to two to one or three to one. You will see a a, a switch by Frank Vogel before the end. I I can rest assured on that. Yeah, I I agree 100%. I think um, this is the matchup both teams or players on both teams probably want because – the Lakers, if I'm the Lakers bigs or even Blazers bigs, I know like, okay, this is another team that they're possibly going to play big and we might get a chance to play. You don't want to play Houston because you you know that you're not going to play. You know that they're going to, I mean, you can't really play Dwight or JaVale too long unless they, well, especially those guys, because they're not really going to dominate by feeding the ball in the post to them. So the only advantage they'll have is maybe on the offensive glass, but they're still going to have to defend out in space, and most shot blockers do not want to come outside the paint. Yeah. So Portland is a matchup where I think sometimes both coaches rely on these two big lineups, and it kills the offensive flow. <laughs> so, like, I mean, there's been times I'm watching the Blazers, I'm like, please take these two bigs out. Like I saw a lineup they had Nurk and Whiteside on the floor together. I'm like, of course the opposing team wants that. Pack the lane. Yeah. Yeah. Just pack the lane. And then uh I mean the Lakers were able to get away with it because they were just able to out talent teams. But we all know when the game is on the line, they're gonna go small. And they they have the flexibility to to play both ways. But you're Lakers 4-2. I'm Blazers 4-2. So we will see uh, who ends up being correct. So let's move on to the next series. And who is your choice for out of Houston and Oklahoma City? That one's going to be a tougher one than I had anticipated because you're seeing the issues with Russell Westbrook and his injury right now. 
he's going to be out what the first two to three games, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, I've seen series. the first one for sure. Uh, in my opinion, I just think it depends on how the first game goes. Let's say Oklahoma City comes out and wins by 20. He's going to play game two, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Uh, I think at this point in time, I think it's a close call. I think it's uh, going to go full seven. I'm going to go with Houston. I just think in the end, you have the most prolific score. I mean, Oklahoma City, do they really have a score that's going to go ahead and take over a game? besides Chris Paul and Chris Paul can only do it for you these days in stretches and he saves his energy for the end of the game that's why they're so clutch at the end Mm -hmm. I think at this point in time when it comes to what you can see is with Houston they still have if Westbrook is anywhere near healthy two still dynamic performers that can go ahead and give you stretches of dominant performances and with Oklahoma City like I said it's Chris Paul but they work better as a team, and you can see that. I, I just think it's going to go seven, and I think it's going to be Houston at this point in time. I think small ball is going to be just enough at this point around. Yeah, and I think with the Thunder, Chris Paul is their third leading scorer. And um, so he's probably not the one that's going to go – actually, he may even be their fourth leading scorer. He may average less than like 15, Gallimard. 16? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know they have like a bunch of guys between 20 and like maybe 17. So it could yeah. be Alexander one, Gallinari two, Schroeder, Paul. I know they're all close, um, which I guess you can say kind of plays into the advantage because they have four guys that they probably can get their own shots. But, you know, in the playoffs, it usually comes down to your superstar. Yeah. And one of my knocks on Chris Paul is I always felt like the difference between him – and an Isaiah Thomas is if Isaiah's team needed him to score 50 to win the game, Isaiah would do it. Yeah. I think Chris Paul has the same capabilities. Even if you look at their stats, like they're very similar as far as like points and assists, even though Isaiah probably has the reputation more so of a scorer. And, Chris and Paul has a better shooter of the two. Yeah. Well, more efficient, opinion. more efficient. Yeah. But I always felt like those Clipper teams never – reach their full potential because when the game came down to clutch situations, Chris Paul would defer. Like there were times where JJ would take the big shot or Jamal would come off the bench and take the big shot, which those guys are capable, but Isaiah Thomas was taking the big shot. If not, he was creating it off of him being a threat to shoot. I just felt like Chris Paul never really, dominated fourth quarters but this year for whatever reasons he's been like the most clutch fourth quarter player in the league he's made big shot big shots and so i'm sure if i were clippers fan i'd be like oh now <laughs> but can he get you those explosive games he's never been one to say you know what i'm gonna put the whole entire team on my back right. for an entire game he like you said waits until the fourth quarter fourth quarter he picks his spots and he's become one of the best clutch players. So if it's close, obviously he's going to be a key factor there. But you have two dominant forces that will go ahead and say, you know what, I'm going to go for 30 today. I'm going to go for 40 today. With Oklahoma City, you don't have that one superstar that says, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and take take my, the whole team on my back for the entire game. And I think that's going to be end up being the difference. It's in a Game 7 performance, you're going to see Harden go for 50 or for 40, you're going to see Westbrook go for 30 and them get just enough outside shooting from everybody else to go ahead and pull it out. Right. And then I just wonder what does the Thunder do with Steven Adams? He's such a, a big part of, you know, just their culture. It seems like for the past eight to 10 years, and it's, I don't even know if he's been in the league that long, but it just, he's been the most consistent Thunder player in years. And does Billy Donovan find a way to play him and make him effective? Um, Because I feel like if you try to take advantage of him in the post, then you've thrown your offense out of sync because that's not their game. And then if you're not taking advantage of him, then what is he really doing out there? He's going to have to be really effective on the offensive boards. Yeah. Stay in the game. Yep. Which, um, you know, more and more teams don't care about the offensive (laughs) glass i mean i've been watching some of these games and like it's like if you watch dallas play as soon as a team shoots they're gone 
you know, because yeah. they want to get back on defense to at least try to have a set defense against Dallas's offense. And I know, like, Doc Rivers, he's known for just not crashing offensive glass ever. He's just like, get back. So, yeah, I'm curious to see how Adams is used and if Oklahoma City tries to either A, play through Adams, which is not their, you know, not how they're used to playing, or if they B, try to go small and match the Rockets size for size, then it also kind of puts them at a disadvantage because they're not used to playing that way. But I do think having Gallinari at the five in this matchup could be pretty fun, pretty fun to watch. So I wouldn't be shocked to see like 140 in the 130s in the playoffs, which. That would be fun. Yeah. That's fun to watch. Yep. All right. The next series. And this one is kind of, kind of tricky too, because there's so many key factors and guys. Who did you take Houston, Oklahoma City? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. So I got Houston at six. Okay. Houston. Yeah, I had like I had Houston in seven. So. Yep. All right. So Denver and Utah. Mm. This is like I mean Utah's missing two starters. Denver's yep. missing a couple guys uh, with um, Barton and Harris aren't playing. Jamal Murray is probably not in really good shape. I mean, did you see like his first game back? Was that the game that went into like all those overtimes and he played? Yes. A lot of minutes his first game back. Um, I mean, I thought that was interesting. I think Denver now has a big three, which they really hadn't had before. But I think now it's official that they have a big three. I have them beating Utah just because Conley's going to miss at least the first. He may miss the whole series because, Yeah. uh, I mean, the way the The games are set up, going there for the birth of his child. I don't even know if the child has been born yet. So if the kid is born Tuesday, he's there for a day or two, then the four day quarantine, he could be out for for the entire series. And just especially if it's short. Yeah. And talk about like bad luck for Utah. I mean they and he had, was just starting to play well. Just starting to play well. They had a lot of promise going into the season. Um then the Rudy situation, then um you know, the, they thought there's going to be major chemistry issues between their two big stars. Bogdanovich was playing well. He gets hurt. Then right when Conley starts to play well, he's going to be out. And, uh, yeah, I mean, just it's been like an unfortunate season for, for Utah. And then Denver, I mean, they've had, I don't know, their fair share of guys. I mean, at one point, we didn't know how many guys actually had in the bubble. There are rumors they only had like eight guys there. They had these crazy lineups, and they've been able to maintain. And uh, but what makes this situation, this series, interesting to me is I feel like Utah was looking for Denver. Like Denver was the team. I feel like some teams were hoping to play. Like that's Utah was trying very hard to lose. They won't yes. say that. You, but they were tanking people a lot of people are accusing them of tanking yeah they wanted denver like this is the matchup that they felt was the most favorable for them and they have it and in my opinion if you tank and you in so many words calling someone out you better win yeah i agree i agree and but right now mpj michael porter jr he is doing a whale of a job i mean you see that growth and maturation right there and it just shows you the the staff and the executives that are in Denver, just the mindset that they have, that they're willing to be patient to let these players grow. I mean, you're starting to see it, obviously, with Michael Porter Jr., who I think is going to become a, a big-time player. Like you said, they now have a big three in Denver going forward, and he's going to play a key factor. I understand he's young, but he, I think he's going to play a key factor going forward. I think the crowd – not being there is going to help a lot of these younger players Mm -hmm. that they won't get so tuned out or, or rattled uh, as you, they normally would in a normal playoff scenario. So you're going to see players like Michael Porter, Jr. Luka Doncic. You're going to see a lot of these younger players, I think thrive in this type of scenario. Uh, And also it helps what we've seen with Denver, that, that situation that they have, it's going to help their, their, team going forward and they're going to be something to reckon with for a long long time because bull bull 
who we saw, they just had to be patient with him. They had to be patient, make sure he's healthy, and look at him as far as someone coming off the bench that can contribute like he can, that can do the things he can do at 7-2. I mean, people still see him as kind of amusing and whatnot. He's a real player, and he can be so effective for so many reasons on the floor. And they've got a bright future. And like you said, if they get those two players back, to help fill out that rotation even more. They, I, I'm going to already tell you right now that Denver is going into the second round. I think with the losses of Bogdanovich and Conley are just going to be too much to overcome. And I see them getting actually, uh, I'm going to say they're going to win in five games. But the next going, series going forward, Denver's not going to be a pushover. And I think anybody who thinks they are is going to be kidding themselves because if they get back fully healthy by the second round, they could be really tough to stop. Yeah, I, I think so too. It just seems like that's the team that other teams would have wanted to face. I mean, like if I were the Mavs, I would have said, oh, I would rather play I'd rather play the Nuggets than the Clippers in the first round. Uh, if I'm, you know, OKC, I'd probably rather play the Nuggets than the Thun I mean the the Rockets in the first round. I think it's because teams thinks that Jokic Murray combo is a good combo, but they're not the elite elite combo that people think that they can't stop. Like let's say Kawhi and PG or LeBron right. and AD, they don't put them anywhere near that type of hierarchy. So I'm assuming that's why that they think they're easier to stop. Yeah. And I don't know. I just, cause even like last year with the Blazers, when they beat Denver in that series and they made it to the Western conference finals, they didn't get respect as like a legit team that went to the conference finals. It was like, yeah. you know, you beat, you beat Denver, you beat OKC. Um, they just beat who was in front of them. But also I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, well, I say this, I think that teams may feel like one of Denver's greatest advantages has been taken away. And that is their home court advantage and the altitude and, and all of that. And what you can say the same for Utah, because Utah, I mean, I've been to a few playoff games, but I was at the Jazz Thunder playoff series in 2018. And that was as loud of an NBA crowd that I've ever experienced. And so Utah doesn't have that advantage to rely on, which I think, I mean, like home court advantage in the NBA is always, you know, it's always a plus. But I think there are a couple teams, Thunder, Jazz, Denver, to where their home court does have, you know, create a real advantage for them. If you're the Clippers, I, I don't think it matters because <laughs> there's, there's not a, you know, I don't think home court means a lot to them or has much impact on their, on their games because I feel like, I mean, when I lived in LA and I used to go to a lot of Clippers games, it was like a transplant city, you know, every LA person that lives in every person that lives in LA that's from Chicago is at the Bulls game. Same with the Knicks, same with Minnesota, but those fans can't afford to go to, I shouldn't say they can't afford, but the Lakers game is so much more expensive yep. that you can't really like have any type of, you know, you're not going to get a hundred people they were the Los Angeles Chargers before the Los Angeles Chargers. Right. Yeah, you can't get 100 people in a section from another city to make some noise in L.A. because those tickets just are hard to get. And nobody wanted to go downtown to the sports arena anyways. If you <laughs> right. remember. Yeah, I think they've torn it down since, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. But even uh, like when they were in the Staples Center, like I was there 14, 15 season, I went to every home game and my whole section would be, and I sat in the section like right behind the opposing team's bench. And it was like the family section for the Clippers. But everyone around would be from different parts of the country. You know, like if they played, like for example, I remember going to the game where they played the Bulls it was a lot of Chicago Bulls jerseys in the crowd. A lot of people from Chicago. You can't do that at a Lakers game. You may have people spread, you know, spread out in different parts here and there, but you're not going to have a whole section that can in red. I've never seen, you know, that in a Lakers game. 
I'll put it to you like this, my friend. Um, you know, when you watch the NBA, all the, the local uh, presentations, the sports networks and whatnot, and you see them trying to sell people on these packages, come see this great, go ahead and get this great seven game package. It's going to include LeBron and the Lakers. It's going to include Joel Embiid and the 76ers. You notice the Lakers don't ever do that or advertise that, but the Clippers, yeah, they sure do. They even do even this year, if I remember correctly. So yeah, it's it's the fact that there's all they're always going to be looking up at the Lakers, right. and and uh, you know they right now have done a great great job of of providing that type of platform. Now they're doing a great job of providing a team that can that can obviously has a great chance of winning the the NBA championship. Something that they've never done. But even if they win. I don't think they'll ever get this, the respect that they're due. And it, it, it's unfortunate, but that's just what happens after 30 years of, of just, you know, well, you know, you know, it's just yeah. ineptitude by, by their front office for so many years and their ownership. And, and the way the, uh, that LA as a whole sees the Clippers as the other kid, no yep. matter how well it can do, no matter how well they can do, it just, it, it, won't make much of a difference uh and that's 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 a shame because again like i said they're finally turning their organization around in the past what 10 15 years they've finally become a really good organization their future is looking bright for long term they've got a great new arena that they're going to build near the forum thank goodness they're not going to tear it down and uh, you know i just think it's the future is looking great for them but unfortunately as long as they want to stay in la it's going to be ever so hard for them to go ahead and be the focal point of the entire city yeah impossible i mean the lakers hadn't made the playoffs in what six years six or seven, seven. years seven years and they're still more talked about than the clippers yep when the clippers were at least going to the second round of the playoffs but they're more attended yeah, <laughs> yeah. even when they were losing yeah, I mean, Lakers tickets are, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it will always be a Lakers town, no matter what. I mean, I, even if the Clippers won back to back championships, it's, it's still going to be a Lakers town, which is a perfect transition to the next playoff series Clippers versus Mavericks. Um, worst possible matchup for Dallas. I think that they've played well against the Lakers, they've played well against other teams. I um, mean, the one issue they have had this season is closing games. Like their late game offense has, uh, is, is kind of been weird because they have a historically good offense. But for whatever reason, it's late in the game. They just haven't been as efficient. And so I, I really think that they can compete with anybody in a seven-game series. But this is the worst possible matchup for them because they're so heavily dependent on Doncic. And he's been great. I mean, I, I know he's put up good numbers against the Clippers, but they're not efficient. And L.A. can just throw two to three guys at him, wear him down, and he is the engine of that offense. Like, they don't go without him, um, you know, creating shots for others because they really don't have a lot of guys that can really create their own shot. They have a lot of outside shooters. And... I mean, what luxury the Clippers have of being able to maybe start him off with Beverly picking him up full court, and then if he calls for a switch, now you got Paul George, then you can put Kawhi on him. I mean, you can put those three different defenders on him in the first quarter and just kind of rotate them and wear him down. So I live in Dallas, and um, I think this series goes five games. I mean, I think the Clippers win 4-1. Wow, I'm I'm actually thinking a sweep to be honest with you, for the Clippers. Uh, there's just so many players on the Clippers that you can put up against a player like Doncic. Yeah, I mean, you're not even talking about a Jamichael Green. You're not even talking about some of the other players that they, mm -hmm. they can throw for five minute stretch here and there. They don't have to just throw Beverly, PG, and Kawhi at him. They, there's so many looks that they can give uh, Doncic. I think. Poor Zingas is going to be a key for them to stay anywhere near the series. I mean, he's going to have to average over 30 for them to go ahead and be close to them because they're going to give Doncic a hard time. They're going to let poor Zingas shoot as much as he wants. They're going to let him do as much as he wants because they're, they're not scared of him. Yep. It, it's Doncic that they're scared of. And if Doncic 
is not going to be able to give any type of range to go ahead and take over the game because he's got either Paul George, you know, a Kawhi or a Patrick Beverly in his face the whole time, then you know what? <laughs> it's going to be a tough time for, for Dallas. They just don't have the supporting cast. I mean, we talk about the Lakers. Dallas really does not have the supporting cast to go ahead and get them past the Clippers, or at least I don't even think get them a game. Maybe they'll get a game if they're lucky. That, but Dantich is going to have to be really, like you said, really efficient. That's the key. And I don't think he's going to be efficient at all. I, I would I would love to see his field goal shooting percentage for the for the round. I think it's going to be in the low 30s. Yeah, and experience is also on the Clippers side. Porzingis hasn't played a playoff game. Um, Cleaver Dodgers. hasn't played a playoff game. Dodgers hasn't played an NBA playoff game. Hardaway may have played early in his career with the Knicks, maybe. Um. Uh, who else? Yeah, I mean, they don't have any playoff experience. Seth now, I will Curry. say, yeah. Well, Seth played with the Blazers last year. Yeah. Um. That's it. That's that. Yeah. That's that's pretty much it. Um. I mean, JJ has championship experience. <laughs> JJ Barea, but that was. I mean, I don't think they've been to the playoffs since maybe fifteen or sixteen. So it's it's been a while. I mean, Doncic doesn't seem like the type of player that's rattled either way. I, I think like, you know, like the Euro League, it's it's one game and you go home, yeah. so you don't get a chance to live to see the next day. Well, I mean, even I guess in the Spain and ACB they have like playoff series, but NBA playoffs is a little bit different than the Euro League playoffs. Even though I feel like the Euro League Final Four is a lot more intense, just because it's one game and you have, you know, countries, <laughs> you, you know, your country behind you as opposed to just your team. But yeah. anyway, uh, so I think he'll be fine. I don't think he'll be rattled because he just doesn't seem to really get rattled like that. Um, but, yeah, it's just – I mean, they're a young team still. So this is, uh, this is the year that they're probably going just to get their feet wet in the playoffs, and I think they're going to be dangerous going forward. Uh, I think they will be too. Uh, uh, I just think that that's a bad matchup for the Mavericks right now. And I think that it's going to be a very easy time for the Clippers in this round. Going forward, I think they're going to have a lot of tougher matchups. Uh, but I think right now it's going to be a very easy one between the Mavericks and the Clippers. Yep, I agree. So now let's go to the conference that isn't as exciting. <laughs> um, the Bucks, And I, I just tweeted before we got on. I've never in my life seen a team more disrespected than the Bucks. And when I say disrespected, I'm talking about they have the reigning MVP, possibly two-time MVP. They have the best record in the NBA, and they get the 12-30 game. <laughs> like, luckily for them, there's only two gyms. If there weren't, they'd be playing on NBA TV. Like, yeah. nobody cares. And – and I was just saying, like, all right, I know LeBron is LeBron, so it may not be the best comparison. But LeBron could have played me, you, Laker Tom, and my brothers, and that would have been on at prime time. You know it. You know it. <laughs> and, and he was in Cleveland, so you can't say it was like it was the market. Giannis has done everything that you expect out of a superstar. I mean, he hasn't won a championship yet, but they went to the conference finals last year, I believe. Yeah. MVP, and they get the 12-30 game. And I looked. I, there's only one game. Like, let, I mean, I think this series is going to be a sweep. There's only one game where they're not playing either at noon or 12-30. And that one game, they're playing at five. And the Pacers-Heat series, which I think, you know, everybody thinks is going to be a better series. But <laughs> they're playing after the Bucks. Can you name – an MVP in league history that played on a team with the best record that would have the early game? No, I can't. It's amazing. Unless you could say maybe Russell Westbrook when he was with Oklahoma City, just because, you know, the market as far as that's concerned. But still, this is going to be very tough to watch for people out there, NBA fans who truly appreciate it. 
uh, you know, what Giannis can do for the game. But again, it comes down to the market, comes down to the interest level. And, you know, the, these guys and gals that are running the ESPNs and TNTs of the world, they see the ratings. Right. So they know actually how much Giannis actually moves the needle when it comes to the playoffs. Now, as he gets maybe, as you and I are or probably, probably predicting, they're going to get far in the playoffs. As they get farther, maybe he will get more attention. But I think he has to win a title in order to get him back into the slot that you and I think he deserves to be in. I don't. If this is another failure for him this year, then it just goes down even further, no matter what he does. And I think that's that's wrong, but I think it's the reality of the situation that he needs to win a title to get that kind of top rank notoriety that we're seeing now from what LeBron, AD, Kawhi, and you're also seeing it from players like Dantic, and you're still going to see it. You know, he's not the he's not with the in crowd yet. It's going to take a title for him to get with the in crowd. I feel like we're at high school. And he's not the, he's off of the side. He's not at the lunch table with with the letter guys. So well, in order exp, exp, explain Zion, he did nothing. Yeah, yeah, he's Zion. <laughs> Zion Zion's the one that's already stepped in there. I mean, you see Zion on the forefront of all the the NBA stuff already, as far as you see his face, his likeness, his image, and all that. So he's at the table already with the letter guys. But you see Giannis, who has this already acclaimed history and resume. He's still off to the side with with, yeah, I don't know, maybe the, the geeks in the library club and all that. But if he wins that title, I think that's what's going to click it in with fans that, hey, this guy's something special, which you and I already know he already is. And nobody, in my opinion, has had to win a title to get into the cool club. But am I wrong <laughs> on that? Tell no, me you're, 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 you're 100% right. And I think part of it is his personality in a sense. He's not, I mean, he's not like, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or anything like that, but he's not in the inner circle of, you know, the, you know, he didn't grow up with certain, with these guys. He seems to only really be tight with his brothers and whoever his teammates are. Um, he has this old school mentality that some people said it like, well, you know, you don't like the, the guys that you're playing against, or you're not buddy, buddy, you're not golfing with these guys or hanging out with them. So he does have that going for him that people claim that they like, but I've just been amazed at how he doesn't really move the needle as far as ratings. And you can say it's market size, but even like Zion to me was more marketed than Anthony Davis was. In yeah. New Orleans, like I can't recall seeing Anthony Davis on prime time more than twice a year. But you can't say it because he was a foreign player. Well, you can say it in a sense because he was a foreign player. Because Doncic, he had that, you know, like you said, he was in in Europe prime time, but he was also drafted high. Maybe he was because Giannis was not picked so high, and he blossomed into this great player. Maybe that's part of the the reasoning as well. People didn't expect this from him, and he just creeped up on people as this truly outstanding player. I, I, I still am trying to wrap my head around the fact that he is not a premier uh, draw in this league, because if you see him play, you're awed by his performance, because even if the, no matter how packed the defense is, he managed to find a squeeze a way to go ahead and still put up 30. And it just is amazing to see how, he gets still this lack of respect that I think he deserves. Yeah. And he's athletic. So I could see on one hand, someone says, well, his game isn't necessarily visually pleasing because he's not going to throw any highlight passes. There's no crossovers. There's, you know, it's like get the rebound straight line drive, but he like probably led the NBA in dunks and yeah. he's like a seven foot guard. He doesn't shoot the ball. He shot a, a little bit better, but you're not, you know, he's not going to beat you with the jump shot. And, and that's whatever, what's scary. Yeah. <laughs> and for whatever reasons, he just doesn't get the same respect. Um, and, you know, it could be a lot of things, you know, like, like you said, he's, he's, uh, he's not from the States. He doesn't really do a lot of commercials. Maybe his last name is just too long for people to pronounce. I don't really see Giannis jerseys on kids out in the streets. Um, I mean, he has a signature shoe that seems to do well. 
And luckily for Milwaukee, he doesn't seem like a guy who's interested in being a marketable star. So I think that plays in their favor as far as keeping him long term. If he did have interest in that, then the rumors of him to New York or L.A. or wherever would be all over the place. Yeah. So I think that plays in Milwaukee's favor. But I was just thinking, like, it's just funny that here this guy is. He, I mean, he has all the accolades and, you know, uh, regular season team success. But NBA is like, oh, first game. <laughs> like exactly. the JV game. And, I mean, even like Christmas, I wonder, I have to check and see, but is he the early game on Christmas every year? Most likely, yes, unless he's going somewhere or playing on the West Coast. But, yeah, I would imagine he's going to be the early game, which is kind of, again, very sad to see. But I don't feel too bad for him because I think, like you said, just because the reasons you were talking about, that he's not high profile or anything of that nature, that he's more apt to take the Supermax than other players. So uh, that would mean he's going to be in Milwaukee for quite some time. I have a, I have a feeling that he's just going, he's satisfied with where he's at and that he is going to take the super max when offered to him and that he's going to be there for a long time. I don't think he's going to, I think he's a lower risk of going out into the free agent market than, than other high profile players have in recent years. Right. And I think they can offer it to him in two months. Close to three. Yeah. I mean, pre-corona money yeah. we don't know what it'll be like but i think they can offer it to him this summer yeah so uh, I, we, I think he might take it yeah I, I think so too unless something just terribly wrong happens in the playoffs which I, I don't i don't i don't know i don't think that's likely so we both have that series <laughs> we didn't really talk about it as a sweep at least i do i, I guess i didn't get your answer well jonathan isaac not being there yeah. Is the key. Had Jonathan Isaac been healthy and been the Jonathan Isaac that we've seen mature and grow as a player, I think that would have given enough problems to maybe take a game. But no, not now. I don't, I don't I even think, think uh, so because I don't think Orlando has enough offensive firepower. No. Yep. No. I'm not, I'm not impressed with anything I see from Orlando. Uh, they don't really have much fight or anything to offer. I was kind of disappointed at their overall – uh, performance in the bubble i really thought they would you know leap over brooklyn and they unfortunately did not so they get the the milwaukee bucks and i think it's just going to be just four and off four and out. yep yeah. speaking of the bucks i'm sorry speaking of the nets they have toronto and the nets have been in my opinion the second most surprising team in the bubble i mean everybody talks about phoenix but I don't think enough attention has been paid to what Jock Vaughn and the Nets did in the bubble. And I mean, how many of their rotation guys aren't even here? I mean, I, think I guess five. not even counting Durant, Kyrie, Dinwiddie, DeAndre Jordan, um, Wilson Chandler. Yep. Uh, I feel like I'm missing someone else. So, I mean, what team can lose four rotation guys? and still be competitive i don't think many i don't think many would and i mean these are i mean it's not like they're just rotation guys it's like probably they're two leading scorers yeah <laughs> with Kyrie and and i mean you know the rumors are that kd and Kyrie are going to pick whoever the coach is i think jock vaughn's name should definitely be in consideration for that job i agree um but, you know, I think he has a good chance because based off of the the uh, coaches that name you keep hearing coming up, two of them were last coaching the Nets. <laughs> so that kind of leaves Tyron Lue as the only as the only option because, uh, I mean, it doesn't make sense to bring Kenny Atkinson back. And then, I think Luke's going to go to the Pelicans, though. Well, so, so if that's the case, then the Nets are – I mean, I guess they have to give the job to Jacques Vaughn. Like, who else would they hire? Hey, Based I, off I, the I, names you've been hearing. But if I'm Lou, you know, if I want the – I have to ask myself, do I want the Nets job or do I want the Pelicans job? Well, the Pelicans can offer them, him the job, like, today. And yeah. the Nets can't. So do you wait on which one? And, and I, I have posted about it. If I'm going to 
take a head coaching job. I'm taking one in the Eastern Conference. I'm yeah. staying away from the West because, I mean, if if you take the Pelicans job next year and they play really well, do they make the playoffs? Because Golden State is coming in for a spot. So you have That's to right. hope Portland, Dallas, or OKC, or one of these teams that is a you know had a pretty good season falls out just to make it. So yeah, I'm, and I'm other staying. teams like Phoenix that that Phoenix. played so well, eight no Spurs. I mean, they're still they they competed well in the playoffs. I think they found something when they finally stopped trying to play big. But yeah, I would I would take uh I would I would take a job in the Eastern Conference. But as far as the Nets, I mean, just they've played well with, you know, Joe Harris has played well. Karis LeVert is is looking like he's a very high level. NBA player like I just wish he shot better from outside I just wish he shot yeah. better yeah because he can I mean he can put the ball in, in the hole and he yeah. needs the ball which makes it an interesting fit for him and and Brooklyn long term almost called him New Jersey <laughs> they've been out of New Jersey oh, I think a he's a better fit for them going forward I know there's been some question on that but I think as a your sixth man off the bench I think he fits better with what they're doing than Dinwiddie I think Dinwiddie of the two I would trade because the fact that I think Dinwiddie feels himself more as a starter in the situation uh, than Levert. You could talk Levert into a six-man, 30 minutes a game type of player, whereas Dinwiddie will probably want to see himself as you know a guy who wants the ball each and every time out. And the problem is there's two other players that are going to be higher up on the food chain mm-hmm. than than he is so i think of the the two i would trade dinwiddie for you know players that might round out uh that form a little bit better you know because we don't even know what we're going to get with durant Uh, yeah i mean he's to me at one time he was playing better than any player on the earth and we don't know how close he will be to that player when he comes back so we're not nobody's nobody knows for sure and there's got to give him some time so you well, he's had over a year. I mean, by the time he plays his next game or first game in Brooklyn, it will be at least 18 months. But we got to remember how many years he's been in the league and how – because he's now, what, 31? Probably close to it, yeah. And he's about 14, 15 year in the league? Mm, wow, 07 draft? Yeesh. <laughs> time Get, flies. Getting up there. Time flies, man. Time flies. But yeah, it just, you know, he's not as young as he, anymore as people are thinking. So, and he's coming back from a serious injury. So you don't know what kind of Kevin Durant truly you're going to get. Will you get him as consistently that great player over the course of a season? Or will you get him for just stretches? Like you're seeing with some other, these great players where they're just doing what they need to do in stretches. So going forward, you're going to need a team to build around. And I just don't think Dinwiddie's the perfect fit, but I like you think Jock Vaughn should be given every consideration for the coach because he's done a whale of a job and they're playing far beyond what I thought. I thought they were going to go 0 and 8. Yeah. I mean, you probably thought they were going to go 0 and 8 and they haven't. And I think they're going to give Toronto a little bit of fight and I see it going i want to say six games oh wow yeah maybe just because toronto i think is going to underestimate them i have it as a sweep but i have it as one of those sweeps where every game is competitive and then they just get out talented at the end kind of like the blazers warriors series last year i think the blazers led every single game going into the fourth and then talent just took over at that point and yeah. this Nets team is not going to quit. Like, they they were the opposite of the Pelicans. Like, the Pelicans had something to play for. The Nets really didn't. Like, they could have went 0-8, and, and they were probably still going to make the playoffs. But they came out hungry, and they played as if they were fighting for their playoff lives with guys that, I mean, how many NBA fans know – Oh, yeah, we forgot that Torian Prince wasn't playing. How many NBA fans know Roydian Karuts or Dante Hall or Nick Claxton, Chris Chioza? Uh, PLC. Yeah. I mean, these are I, – I, I'm just, like I said, I'm kind of speechless in the fact that how well they competed. And they almost knocked the Blazers out of the playoffs. <laughs> so, 
Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they played hard. I, like I said, I think it's still going to be a sweep. I think Toronto is just going to win games in the fourth quarter just because they have, I mean, obviously they have the experience and they're more talented, but the nets are going to make them work. It, it may be a sweep on paper, but they're, they're definitely going to work. They're not going to cruise through. Like I think Milwaukee does. I think they're going to sneak at least one, if not two. I'm going Levert to would have to score 45. I think he can. I think, <laughs> I think he, he will. Even though I was wondering, like, if Nick Nurse is going to use one of his junk defenses. Oh, he, he will. See, I think he may not. I think he may save it for the next round. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. You're right. You're right. If it, because it, it, I mean, they've got this series all the way. I, when I say they're stretching it to six, it's still going to be like a six game where it's going to probably be a blowout because Brooklyn will just they have given up all their energy, you know, and they just won't have any left to to match up with Toronto. So I think that it's it's Toronto's all the way. It just Bro- Brooklyn will probably make it a little bit more uncomfortable for them because, like you said, as an effort team, they they're really one of the best teams out there from an effort standpoint. Yep, and it's it's. I mean, I guess at this point you have to say it's the front office or the culture that they've built because the same was with Kenny Atkinson. I felt like they had overachieved last season. And then this year, I, I don't know. I just kind of feel like the Kyrie dynamic kind of threw them off a little bit. I felt like they played well without him. And then right when everyone expected them to just be awful, like this team is awful on paper. They're <laughs> really bad on paper if you look at it. And you really have to be a diehard NBA fan to name, like, some of these guys on, on the roster. But they competed. And um, – but, yeah, I, I just like the culture that they've built. And um, I'm really interested to see how next year goes for them as far as, like, their pieces. Because as far as, like, Levert, I think this is an opportunity for him to really show how good he is in front of, like, a national audience. Yeah. And if he comes off a very strong series, let's say it does go six games like you're predicting, which means he's going to have to put up crazy. He's going to have 30-plus, cra- 30-plus 30 30 a game. So do you go back to – how do you convince him to be the sixth man <laughs> after a strong playoff series like that? That's going to be a hard call. I mean, very but hard. Again, uh, but again, he's got to understand as well. If he's a team, if he's a team player, he's going to understand that you have so many pieces of the puzzle out. Mm-hmm. That's why you're getting a lot of those shots. And and the thing is, you see what works for the Clippers. They're able to go ahead and have a Lou Williams and a Montrezl Harrell play for 30 minutes, but still come off the bench and still be there at the end. So you could go ahead and convince him to, if you look at it from that angle, it right. I might've been a harder sell in previous years, but seeing how the Clippers have done it, I think it's probably easier sell. And you, he could really just be something special for the, for them as a uh, hybrid starter. Cause I don't think you're also going to get 82 games out of Durant next year yep. or Kyrie Irving. So he's going to start at least 20 of those games. And in his case, I kind of look at it from a business perspective if I'm representing him, which I think he's under the same agency as Durant anyway, so I think that kind of helps the Nets out in a sense. But he's had some injuries. He has a very, very team-friendly contract. If I'm not mistaken, I remember some people were kind of upset about his contract because he kind of ruined the market for guys in his – But he had an injury history there. He had an injury history. Yeah. And this is his opportunity to put himself in position to get – paid <laughs> big time i mean of course there's always going to you know be the injury issues that kind of uh will be brought up in negotiations but i think that it's it's going to be tough for him to accept or really you know he's young i mean i think the difference between lou will accepting his role and even like a jamal crawford when they accepted their roles as six men they were a little bit older and kind of had more established in the league yeah and, you know, a lot of times when you're young, you want to get the big, big contract and you want to kind of get your team. I don't know him personally, but I do think if he has a really good playoff series, it's kind of hard to say, hey, now we need you to come off the bench. Well, if Joe Harris leaves in free agency, 
because I believe he is a free agent this year. He is. Then that makes it easier to stick yep. Karis Levert in the lineup and keep him in the lineup as far as the starting life is concerned. So, well, I then, think then, they're going to be forced I, to give Joe Harris whatever he wants because he compliments Durant and Kyrie. He's going to be out there. He's going to be, he's going to be overpaid. I mean, even in a, in a cash strapped, uh, low value as far as the free agent market is concerned and cash strapped because all these teams are going to be hurt for cash, you're going to see him overpaid. You're going to see him as one of the few that's overpaid this summer. Yeah, I, I believe so. Because there's so many, I mean, shooting is so important in today's NBA, but there's so many teams that have superstars that need a complimentary guy that can space the floor for them. So I, I agree with you 100%. Absolutely. All right, moving on to the next two series, which are a little bit more interesting. We have the Pacers and Heat. I I keep going back and forth on this one, but I think I'm going Miami in seven. I'm going Miami in six. Okay. Um, I think just the injury to Sabonis, I think that's a killer. I understand Warren's playing at an exceptional level. I understand Oladipo's now a lot healthier and playing more effectively. They have Malcolm Brogdon, who I love as a player. It just does everything right. Just really, really solid. But I think that not having Sabonis there, I understand is freed up Warren, mm-hmm. but I think when it comes to a little bit of a slow down game, a little bit more of a power game, Sabonis works. Sabonis is a great player and Sabonis does a lot of things to make that offense click. And I think if you can have him out of the lineup, I think that's really going to be over the course of a seven game series, very hard for Indiana to overcome, especially the fact that there's going to be a lot of need for rebounding right. because you have uh, so many three point shots are going to go up, especially from Miami side. And then Indiana is going to fall in love with three pointer because you know, Miami is going to shoot the three pointer. So I think you're creating a lot of situations there where Miami is going to be very advantageous for them to go ahead and hit the boards uh, with Bam Adebayo. And I think Bam Adebayo against Turner is not a great matchup for Turner. I'm, I, I just I don't see a great matchup for Turner there going forward. So I th- think I'm going to say Miami in six at this point in time. Although Indiana, I mean, if Warren gets hot, who knows? Who knows? Yes, yeah. and he has extra incentive because – you know, he doesn't like Jimmy Butler. <laughs> and <laughs> That's I want to see them match up, matched up against each other. I mean, if we can get this Pacers heat rivalry to turn into like Knicks heat from the 90s where the two teams just really don't like each other, I think that that could make this a really interesting playoff series. I think as far as like Turner and the BAM matchup, I mean, I just think Turner's going to stay on the perimeter and shoot a lot yeah. of threes. And that's just kind of who he is. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I, if he can make threes, then I think it kind of takes Bam out of the middle a little bit, which kind of loosens Miami's defense up. So if I'm, if I'm the Pacers, I'm hoping that he knocks down some shots. But if he's not making threes, then – it's going to be tough for the Pacers. But, yeah, I mean, this whole Jimmy Jimmy Butler, TJ Warren rivalry, I mean, if Butler's cooking – I'm sorry, if Warren is cooking and he's hot, I mean, he – I mean, he went against some pretty good defenders in Ben Simmons and Anthony Davis and just torched them. And then, you know, Pride is going to step in with Butler where he's going to say, look, I know he's playing the four. Butler's not playing the four. He's going to want to match up against him. Yeah. And – I'm looking forward to it. I I see some hard fouls. I see some. But if it gets to a fight, there could be suspensions, and that could be a key too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And I wouldn't be shocked. (laughs) There's a one-game suspension. Mm -hmm. And uh, it makes it even more interesting because, if I'm not mistaken, are they in the same hotel? Yes. I believe so. That's what, in fact, I I think the ESP, and podcasts, a couple of them have mentioned that they were hoping that they would find like, you know, security camera footage of both teams going back or in, a, you know, in the halls, seeing them mix up against each other, find, seeing if they can catch a fight right there in the middle of the hall. So, or in the lobby per se. 
That would I be mean, funny. That would make this bubble documentary. <laughs> that would make it great. I mean, I think ESPN could have some really good content, especially if we're in the same predicament in the next few months, which I think is likely. If they can have this bubble documentary and kind of like, you know, the last dance type thing in November or something like that, right before the season, I think that would be great content. Uh, right. I'd love to see it, man. I'd love, love to see it. it. All right, so we're down to the last series, Boston and Philadelphia. I have Boston winning. I've actually, I have Boston winning in five. I don't think I do the too. Sixers have enough firepower. I don't think that, um, yeah, I just think that Embiid is going to have to be dominant every single game for them to win. He's capable of it. But I just think like they just don't have the floor spacing to really free him up. I think he's going to be tired and he's going to end up settling for jump shots because yeah. even though Boston struggles against bigs and they struggle against um I mean every big has has hurt Boston. They don't have a lot of size. I just think that they're going to pack the paint and dare everybody from Philly to make outside shots. And I, I think this, it should be a pretty easy series for them. Okay, let me ask you this. How many games will it take for MB to try and attempt to kill Shake Milton? Uh, it depends. You know, Shake is, not, <laughs> Shake is not knocking down open jumpers and they're sagging in on him. Then <laughs> it could be game one or, or game two. <laughs> uh, the person I think he should be the most upset with is Elton Brand. Like I've been saying, yeah. like this team is built to beat the 2000 Indiana Pacers <laughs> with yeah. the Davis boys and, and Smiths. And like, I just don't think this team is built for this era of basketball. And, um, so I think they're, they're going to struggle and he's going to be the one that catches the heat and all the defenders in his lap because they don't really have any floor spacing or a point guard that can get in the lane and, and just kind of create open opportunities. And I think Brett Brown may possibly oh, I think be in trouble. Uh, I think it's gone. I think he's got, I think when you consider as far as a uh, hot seat, I think it's like roasting. I think he's like, if he was popcorn, he'd be popped right now because it's just so hot right now. And, and I, I like you, I see it in five. Uh, and I, I see Brett Brown gone. It just is a matter of, is Elton Brand gone with him? I think Elton Brand, uh, there should be a change of place uh, because you've gotten rid of a lot of your future assets. You've got a little, you know, for this, your salary cap is stuck right now with, with Albatross contracts uh, for Al Horford and Tobias Harris. And, They're like $300 uh, million dollars combined, right? For those yep. two? Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I just, right now, I think both should go. I think at this point in time, I think it's just time to get a nice little clean sweep. You've got, and, and ask yourself really, really is the Joel Embiid Ben Simmons duo going to work? Don't tell me you haven't had enough time because you've had enough time. You know, no, I, don't think I, I think gonna it work. isn't going to work. I don't think it's going to work. As long as Ben Simmons doesn't have a jump shot, it's not going to work. And I also feel like his just lack of motivation to, work on his jumper or even if he does work on it the next step is being confident and shooting it in the game i think that has put brett brown on the hot seat yeah if he can knock down jumpers then everything changes but he i mean this is going into what his fourth year i mean well i'm kind of hard on ben simmons because i'm like you had a whole year where you didn't play <laughs> you didn't you know you set out your rookie year you didn't work on your jump shot then. Like, what did you do? <laughs> so, and well, if he's on a team, if he's on a team with the whole, if he's on Houston, you know, it's this would be a moot point because he's got shooters. But he shooters still should on work on. It. Like, I feel like. Oh, I agree. I agree with you. He's on that not stuff. working on it, and I feel he probably thinks like, well, if you build a team around me, then I won't need that. And it just, in my opinion, like I said, I don't know. But guy. life doesn't always work out like that. Yeah. So. Yeah, yep. that's the problem. I mean, you you realize, Ben, what, what type of team you have. You don't have Houston's 12 other shooters on the team. You don't have a team that's 
built around you specifically for your talents. So you got to go ahead and if you want to become that upper echelon, that MVP caliber player, you got to go ahead and work on what is is needed in your game and and i agree with you a hundred percent he should have realized the talent around him and say you know what if you're not going to get me outside shooters i got to become an outside shooter yeah or even thinking like me and Embiid have something special we have the opportunity to be the best duo or one of the best duos in the nba i we have to complement each other yeah but it just doesn't seem like he's willing to to do what it takes to make it work. It seems like he wants it to work around him. Yep. Well, I really, really appreciate you coming on. It's kind of been like, glad to be on. like an hour and 20 minutes has probably been our longest podcast. Uh, you're probably a little bit better at managing the time than I am, but no, it's okay, we, we both love talking basketball and this could go on to the Joe Rogan status with three and four hour podcast. Like how does, how does he do that? Uh, four hour get- podcast. Well, you know, if you if you're paying, if you and I were being paid, but he's being paid, I could do that. Yeah, I, could I mean, that. I can't do it, but it's like the, the <laughs> audience is really listening for that's half their work shift. <laughs> you know, yeah. like you could go on a Joe Rogan podcast and make it to L.A. to Vegas and still have an hour left. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you go on like a Friday at three p.m., then you know that's you know that L.A. to Vegas ride on Friday afternoon, uh, holiday is, weekends is okay. long. But yeah. even then, Joe Rogan can fill up your your ride with <laughs> with his podcast. So, exactly. yeah, I mean, well, don't, well, don't remind me of Vegas right now because yes, I'm living in Vegas. But that strip, man, oh my gosh, it was so crowded this past weekend. It, it, you know, people are just back. It's back to normal in certain places, and I guess the strip is one of them at this point. Wow, in time. it's like it's, wow, it's not even a holiday weekend. I guess people just cabin fever, get out. I'm sure flights to Vegas are probably dirt cheap right now, and yes. Hotels are probably cheap, so I could see that. I have seen a couple of people saying that they were going to Vegas. There you go. There well, you thanks go. again for coming on. Um, where can my audience find you at as far as um, where they can listen to your mini podcast and, and all that you do? Well, I truly appreciate, again, speaking to you anytime, my friend. You've been such a great guest on on the show that I do uh, as far as basketball is concerned, and that's the Lakers Fast Break. Just type in Lakers Fast Break, and it comes right up on all various podcast formats. The main show I do each and every week is the Pop Culture Cosmos, which covers the latest news and trends in pop culture. And if you type in Pop Culture Cosmos, that'll definitely come up on all major platforms. And it's also listened to around the world on over 30 different radio stations. And I'm starting back up again because football season's around the corner. A good friend of mine, Chris, and I do Inside Sports Fantasy Football. So once a week, I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk a little bit of fantasy football for you out there as well. All right. Sounds good. Thanks again for coming on. This is Raphael with the Run the Floor podcast. You can also find my NBA Draft Junkies podcast. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Spotify, Apple And this is a big time coming up for me as far as NBA draft. All the work that I've been putting in since September is now actually we're we're getting close to the day. Actually, by the time this podcast is up, uh, there'll be a couple days later. We'll hear about the actual lottery where we'll find out where teams will be picking. And then from there, that's when the real work starts. So me and Gerald will be speaking to each other often. I'm sure I'll be on the Lakers Fast Break podcast sometime this week. Absolutely. And um, yeah, we'll 3. talk about 0. the draft. Mock oh, yeah. draft 3.0. I mean, I've already had people asking me, when can I come on? When can I be a part of it? So you've got a, already a list, my friend, of people that want to be a part of Mock Draft 3.0. Yeah, we are going to have to figure out a way to like get it on StreamYard. And, and I actually had a dream. It was weird. I had a dream. And, and this is like the last thing I'll talk about that we had 28 or 30 people on there and everybody had one choice. And so my goal is to try to reach out to people on Twitter that, you know, do draft stuff for their team. And you would be the Lakers guy. I already got the Mavs draft guy that's been on the NBA Draft Junkies podcast. And I think that would be pretty big if we can do the live stream where everybody has 
Uh, if we can do two rounds of it too, I think that would be pretty cool. That would be cool. I so would I'm like going to try to work on that. That would be awesome. Make that 4.0. Make that 4.0 because it's going to take a little time work on that. But 3.0, yeah. I know a lot of people are looking forward to just because of the fact that, like you said, the lottery's around the corner. I saw your tweet out, what was a couple of days ago, that talks about your goals yeah. for the next 60 days. And you talk about how hard I work on, on the stuff I do. Nobody works harder than you, my friend. Nobody. I appreciate that. I mean, I, I think it's, uh, it's all going to pay off soon. And and this is like, I have a window. I have like 60 days to like really take advantage of the fact that um, there's going to be more interest in the draft. People are going to be watching basketball all day and people probably have more free time than normal to, you know, read up on draft stuff when watch video. So my goal is to really take advantage of it. So hopefully this is that breakout season for me. And also for you, just everybody that's put in the, the groundwork, hopefully this is like the breakout season that kind of propels me to to where I envision myself being when I started my, my website or whatever. So it's going to be fun, though. I'm going to interview you it's just like you're going to have probably a recap of the draft podcast. I'm going to interview you as well for for my show, the Light Lakers Fast Break. And I'm going to interview you and you're going to have done so much work by that time and you're going to be so tired. You're going to be probably be like a zombie. Uh, so, Rafael, who do you think won the draft? Uh, uh, <laughs> then I got to get on 21. I have to start 21. It's competitive out here now. Exactly. All right. Well, thanks again for coming on. And this is Rafael with the Run the Floor podcast, along with my special guest, Gerald Glassford. And we are out of here.